Lock here again, and this is going to be a treat for you guys. I can feel the the cool tropical breezes blowing right now, and the smell of pina coladas in the air. I've got Donovan Morgan with me, and I guess you can see from the logo he's got on the screen here, and his shirt. He is from Soft Wash Hawaii, and so hey, Donovan, go ahead and introduce yourself. You know, and and uh, where you're from there in Hawaii, and tell us a little bit about your life there on Hawaii. Uh, well, my name is Donovan Morgan. I'm from Eva Beach, Hawaii. Grew up here in Eva Beach when it used to just be sugarcane fields and one road in and one road out. Um, it's progressed a bit to where, where there was once sugar canes, it's all houses. Hmm. Um, happily married to my best friend. Um, I've got two wonderful daughters, uh, six and four. So, yes, I started late, but I'm enjoying wow. life. <laughs> um, life's been fun it's been challenging I would say from one end of the, of the spectrum to the next it, mm. it just continues to, to challenge me but um, you know I, I guess my mother always used to say you know you just take small steps in the right direction and you eventually get there. sometimes they get bigger steps sometimes smaller but you eventually get there <sighs> what else can I say um well, and there's a lot of people, you know, everybody, we, we, we interview in, on this podcast, a lot of people from the United States, of course, mm-hmm. Hawaii is in the United States, but it's not mainland United States. And so there's people that are probably wondering, you know, what do you do there on Hawaii? What is, what is your day like? You know, what, what are the unique things that you love about Hawaii? I know you grew up there, so it's not like you moved there later because you fell in love with Hawaii. This is where you're from. Tell us about Hawaii and what makes it so interesting for you. And, and tell us what you love about where you live. I would say it's growing up in Hawaii, it's kind of a double-edged sword because mm-hmm. you take a lot of things for granted. Um, I spent some time in the military. I okay. think that's when I got the biggest um, wow, leaving, leaving right. Hawaii for the first time, ending up in Great Lakes in the middle of winter, Ooh. Uh, losing <laughs> all of the... The things that you take or take for granted, the warm weather, the food, the friends, the family, and all of that. Um, when I came back, I truly appreciated um, what I had. Um, when I left the military, came back home to live. Um, but again, you fall back into that same relaxed mode, right? Hawaii mode. Mm-hmm. Um, you start taking things for granted. And I worked for Chevron USA here in Hawaii at the okay. out here in Kapolei. My father-in-law was an employee of Chevron. It was oh, a, 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 a geological engineer for them. <laughs> and so I got the opportunity to um, to work for Chevron as a senior consultant in Kazakhstan. And so once again, leaving the islands had never traveled. I've traveled internationally in the Navy. But... You, you just picked like the two coldest places on the earth. <laughs> Great Lakes for boot camp. Yeah, because you must have been in the Navy if you went to the Great yes. Lakes. Yes. Yeah. And then Kazakhstan, wow, that's, that was that's one all the-, the way on the eastern side of Russia, just above Mongolia. Yes. And so that was one extreme to the next. It was yeah. unbelievably cold and unbel- unbelievably hot. Yeah. So it only went from one end of the spectrum to the next. Wow. And, um, again, working there, uh, it was a four-week on, four-week off type of rotation. But after my first... Um, Pitch working there, coming home again, the appreciation for what you have here in Hawaii. Mm. And yes, it is beautiful. Um, a lot of people see what what what's presented on TV in videos and in movies. Right. It's a bit different. Um, I would say people from the mainland or visiting, they see what they want to see, but there's so much more, and it gets so much deeper. But you really got to get into the culture. So what are what are the things that they're not seeing? I would say when people when they talk about um, aloha, mm-hmm. you know, aloha is something deeper than just the words that you hear on TV. Aloha, aloha, and you see them all yes. over time. It's, and, it's and, funny. I was just doing. I do four of these podcasts all the time. We batch them and then we mm-hmm. release them every week. And so the person who was on the call on the podcast just before you was Jim Steinmark, and he's in the Dallas Fort Worth area, and he also grew up on Hawaii. And he was saying the exact same thing that aloha, everybody's used to saying aloha, but aloha isn't a word. It's a culture. 
So dive That's, into that a little more. Yeah. And so the learner can go, it, it, it can go from a happy place. It can mm-hmm. go to a sad place. It can go to a, a mean place or a mm-hmm. Let's, I, I forget. I don't know what word I'm looking for, but um, it, it's, it depends how you use it. It depends on the situation. It depends who you're talking to, how mm-hmm. you talk. So many things, um, which is probably why it's such a verse word uh, in, in Hawaii. But um, yeah, it's it's different. And everybody talks about culture. I would say one thing that I know for a fact is that when you're from Hawaii, it's funny how people still argue amongst themselves when you're in Hawaii and you're from Hawaii. Right. But when you're outside of the state, if you run into anybody that's from Hawaii, it's like you become best friends. Yeah, it's, it's an like instant you bond. Become, yeah. yeah, you share something. And it's, you don't even have to know the person. And here's a perfect example. I, when I first went to Kazakhstan, you had to go to an orientation. And so we're sitting in this big theater hall and they're giving their talk. And somebody in the back, somewhere in the crowd started talking. And I'm like, he's from Hawaii. But you look back, it's just a bunch of people. Yeah. And you wait, and maybe it's just me, I'm, you know, homesick or whatever. And then the same person asks another question. And just from his tone of voice, how he's talking, the words he's using, I'm like, he's got a Southern accent, but he's got that Hawaii going on. And so the vibe. <laughs> yeah. And so after we took a break and you, you just kind of go to the crowd and you're just listening. And then I find him. We're like, hey, dad. I'm like, what's the chances of running into somebody halfway around the world from Hawaii? Right. And he lives, he was living in North Carolina or something like that. And oh my like, goodness. It, it's crazy. And even in the Navy, you know, when we when the ships would hit port, you, we'd have our little group of just people from Hawaii. And everybody thought we grew up together because we were so tight knit. But it was only because we were from Hawaii. And it mm-hmm. was different because you'd see people, say, from Texas, or East Coast, or whatever, say, and they'd say hi and shake hands, but then they'd depart. In Hawaii, for some reason, we kind of just congregate and become become one unit. That's very, very cool. So I just I just want to say right off, thank you so much for your service, for serving our country. Um, we really appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah. All fun. right, cool. So so you you you've grown up here in Hawaii, you've lived in Hawaii, you you left for a while, be, be in the Navy and and work for Chevron. Um Came back and and some of the jobs you've had over the years, it led you to make a decision that you wanted to become an entrepreneur. Tell me about that journey. I mean, is this the first business you've owned? Have you owned other businesses? How did you get to being a business owner, being an entrepreneur? I would say it was a lengthy process. I know at one point in my life, I wanted to do something on my own. Right. Um, I would say in my early years. Um, me and a couple of friends, we tried to start start an automotive, a Volkswagen repair shop. Um, so we got into that, but things but we weren't business people. We were just kids right. trying to make money to go racing, basically. <laughs> so it worked out to pay enough, you know, it paid enough to support the race car, but it didn't pay enough to make it a business. Yes. Um, I would say probably early 2000s, I started a... Um, what abrasive blasting company. Um, and it was more to take up the time that I was home four weeks on and four weeks off. It was kind of a long. What, what kind of company was it? What abrasive blasting. Like wet sand blasting. abrasive. Oh, wet sand blasting. Okay. Yes. Okay. And so it started that company, got all the equipment, got it up and running. Um, again, here's where, you know, knowing business before you jump into it, it seemed like a good idea. It seemed like a lot of people would use the service. but once we got off, once we put uh, the capital into purchasing the equipment and the base yard and all of that, I found out that there wasn't really a demand for it. And mm-hmm. the people who were looking for it weren't looking to pay top dollar for it. Right. So it was actually going to cost us money to do work. Um, and so I, I kept that going because it was more for something for me to do when I came home on my time off. Um, and then life happened. And so working for Chevron, it's a business. I understand business. And everybody's family, be, before, until you become a number that doesn't kind of align with their business plan. Mm-hmm. And so, 
you know, everybody looks to become highly paid. I, mean, I was happy to be highly paid and it wasn't aligning with their business plan. And so they always shaped the top a little bit. And I became part of that, that shaving. Um, came back home, um, you know, still got the sandblasting going, wasn't working out like it should. My body was telling me enough is enough. It's right. kind of a pretty strenuous um, trade. And um, my wife said, what are you going to do? I said, I don't know. So she goes, one day she came up and she goes, hey, go clean the outside of the house. <laughs> so never knew, never knew I was cleaning out. I thought, hey, this shoots water. And so went, research, YouTube, Google, can be dangerous, it can be good and bad. Um, found out that, you know, soft washing terminology. Now I understand what soft washing is, but soft washing is cleaning the outside of the house. So we went, we bought the pressure washer and, and the chemicals and all that stuff. And I'm terrible at math. But we made it happen. Three days later, a whole bunch of dead plants and a bunch of ruined clothes. <laughs> we, um, I got it done, and it looked, the house came out looking pretty good. And then, I guess, knowing, once you have information and knowing what you know, you, you start to look around, and then it's like, well, looks like the neighborhood, you know, not, not that far away from me, would mm -hmm. benefit from a service like this. But I knew what I didn't want. I didn't want to repeat what I had just done. Right. And so... I did more, a little research. more research ensued, right? Did more research. <laughs> so the first thing I needed to overcome was the calculations. I right. didn't want to, you know, drive around with a big 275 gallon tote trying to figure out how much chemical I need to do this. Right. What, and so I came across soft wash systems. So I looked in, I saw the equipment. It's like, hey, what's this? You know, you go, and um, I called up and I talked to Jesse. And Jesse kind of gave me more more information on on the equipment. And then I was sold. And then I had to go back to the boss to ask for permission. <laughs> because I had done this, I had done my, my sandblasting on my own without asking. Right. Them. And it didn't go where it was supposed to go. I went back, talked with the wife, explained to her, well, I can buy this equipment and do what I did with the house. And I can buy it in pieces. I don't have to buy it all at one time. And she kind of slowly turned around and said, who are you kidding? You're going to buy it all anyway. <laughs> <laughs> just and just you know do what you do and so took the jump uh, yeah on board and that's how soft wash away got started and it's been you know the push forward and and the challenges challenges and tribulations right um that constantly come up and down I call it the roller coaster you're happy one day and you're going down you pick yourself up and you just oh. push forward. You know, so so you know, you're you're in a unique area for sure, and and you're in a you're in a tropical. You're not even sub Florida subtropical. You're actually in the tropics, and so you've got the ocean all the way around you. You've got the right mix of humidity, you know, humidity and uh, warm temperatures, and and uh, all the things that you need there. Um, you the big comment that you made the reason why the the you know, wet abrasion blasting or the sandblasting. Mm -hmm. I was trying to figure out what you were saying, but the sandblasting didn't work out well is because there wasn't a big demand for it. And the people that did want it wanted cheap and weren't willing to pay up for it. Uh, everything's dirty in Hawaii. I mean, it's like, it, it's, it's, you know, like the, 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 the state color of Hawaii should be black. I mean, I've seen some of the photos and videos and stuff that you've posted. Um, there was there was a difference. There was definitely a difference between the the need and the demand. Uh, the need was definitely there in Hawaii. The demand wasn't quite there yet. And I know that as you've been building this business and working on it, because how many years in are you now? How many years have you been doing this? We're a little over two and a half years now. Yes, yeah, so I knew you're getting close to three years. So you're getting getting close to three years on this. Um, even though the need was there and things were dirty, there was a significant education phase and you're still educating people. Talk about that a little bit. Yes. And that's been from day one. Um, I'm not a person that likes to say we're the best thing since sliced bread. I'd mm -hmm. rather share the education of what's really going on, what's happening right. with your property, your roof, your siding and so forth. Um, and I leverage my um, my experience from Chevron. So Chevron being a multi-billion dollar company. And when I was working in Kazakhstan, that was a multi-billion dollar facility. Right. And so when you look at maintenance, something that lo loses production, say in 30 minutes, 
That's like millions and millions of dollars right. lost. Um, if you look into it from a property perspective, the dollar amounts are smaller, but the financial stress, the personal stress, all the things that come with things failing when you don't want them to or, right. or, or you don't think they would can, can, can really get to a person or to a family. Um, and so I try to leverage what knowledge I have with a preventative maintenance background and put that into what we do with soft washing. And so when we educate, it's not about, okay, we can get your roof clean. It's this is what we're trying to prevent from happening. And then also share um, lessons learned from, from industry. And then I try to gather information from people who I've worked on with in the past, where, what their pos current position was before mm -hmm. they had us come in and after. Um, and the whole emotional spectrum that goes along with it. Right. Uh, for sure. And so it's uh it's it's different. In Hawaii, I would say the average person doesn't really look at cleaning the outside of their house. That's why everything looks so dirty. They'll cut the grass, they'll trim the trees, they'll wash the car, change the oil. Um, when it comes to the side of the house, they might spray some water. When it comes mm -hmm. to the roof, forget it. There's there's no maintenance on I'm not even concerned about it. Yeah. No. And so that's where the education comes is sharing with people, especially now. With um, with insurance companies coming out and you know canceling policies or threatening to cancel policies, we've picked up business from that spectrum of the market, which is it's good for the business, but it's not good for the people coming to us. It's not right. the, the type of business that we would like to get, but we're happy to help. Um, and we've taken some of those, and, and we've created friendships with people who we've helped in that manner. Um, we actually recently did a uh, a story with Hawaii News Now. Mm -hmm. We helped a retired veteran. Um, his house was a little unkept. Um, his son reached out to us for an estimate. We went out, did the estimate. His father was home. We sat down at the table, talked story a little bit. Shared He shared with me about what he used to do. He was in the Navy, his wife, and what was going on and where he got to at that point. And we kind of doing what we do, being the entrepreneur, being the owner of a business, you can make, you can make, you know, just decisions. Snap decisions. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And so in this, the this, moment. yes, in the moment, as emotional as it was, I knew that this was going to be something that we had to share with the public. And right. the purpose of it was to inform the public of what's already happening. That isn't in front. It's not in the news as it should be. Right. And, most of the people that are getting affected are, are getting blindsided. Right. And so we worked with a friend um, that has a PR company, we worked with a representative from Hawaii News Now. And we kind of, it took us a little while to put it all together. But when the story was complete and they put it on air, it was just emotionally touching. I, di mm -hmm. I didn't expect it to, to hit the heartstrings, but it did. And the story kind of, it, it, it helped me. It, it really did. And I'm hoping that it helped a lot of people to kind of build some some faith that there is there is still goodness in the world. It's just that it's not as it, it doesn't should. have to be bad news all the time. Yes, yeah. I think it was really a feel good moment. So you know, I think you know, and what you're touching on there is this was a veteran, and he was between a rock and a hard spot because he was either going to get his insurance was either going to go up significantly or even get canceled because of his dirty roof, but he didn't have the wherewithal or the finances to take care of that cleaning. So you guys stepped in. Sometimes people, when they look at, like I, I live in a very tourism-based area, Orlando, Florida, and they and they see images of Orlando, Florida, and it looks beautiful and it looks clean and it looks like the streets are paved with gold. And I think people have that same vision of Hawaii is it's beautiful and it's clean and you know they think of the beaches and all that. But I don't and I've not been to Hawaii. Now, my wife tells me that we need to fix this. So I think I think she's told me I'm supposed to be coming out and doing some training with you in the future. And, uh, <laughs> and then we need to come to Hawaii to do a you know an inspection of the facility, so to speak. Um, but I don't think people quite realize. Uh, and again, I haven't been to Hawaii, but from the conversations I've had with other people, the amount of poverty that's in Hawaii. 
uh, that there's a huge divide. There's a lot of wealth and there's a lot of tourism. And then you can turn a corner and there's a lot of poverty, too, as well. So it's not like the streets are paved with gold and everybody can afford to have their house soft washed there. There's a percentage of the people that can. Um, but just like anywhere else, it's not like you're you're so privileged and it's it's such a blessing you're in Hawaii because work must just fall out of the sky for you. It's not that way. Hawaii has its own struggles as well. Yes, very much so. And so I would say if you look at housing in Hawaii, I think the average median single family home, you're looking between seven and nine hundred thousand. Mm-hmm. Which in most states would be a pretty significant property. Right. In Hawaii, that's probably like a plantation. Old single panel wall, you know, nothing, nothing fancy at all. Probably six thousand square foot lot. Mm-hmm. So when you look at dollars compared to in, in the housing market, it's not significant. And that's where the poverty or the challenges come with living in Hawaii. But my mom always said, you got to pay the cost, right, to live in paradise. Right. Yeah, there is a cost. They're, they're pushing there. it to the limit right now. They're pushing people pretty hard. And well, because so, there are a lot of people that do want to live in Hawaii and they're and they're starting to eat up some of this buy up some of this lower cost housing and it is it is pinching the lower class and and not giving them really anywhere left to live. Yes, correct. Yeah. And so it, it's it's frustrating sometimes, especially when, when you hear in the news about, you know, they want to build affordable housing. But when you say affordable housing, it's not, you know, in the States, affordable housing is affordable. In Hawaii, you're looking at a six, seven hundred thousand dollar home, which is considered right. affordable. Um, and I don't know how people do it, but they're still purchasing. I mean, million dollar, million plus you know, properties are still hmm. selling as fast as they can build them. They don't even fast, build them yeah. until they sell them. And so it's, I don't know how people do it, how they manage to put it all together, but um, they do. Um, well, and, and, it's, and, and you've touched on this, it's expensive to live in Hawaii. Everything has to get imported in. There's there's not a lot of stuff that just comes from Hawaii. Even, even our, with our business, if you want a new skid, you got to ship it in. If you want, you know, chemicals, you've got to ship it in. And that adds to the cost and makes everything exponentially more expensive just because it's on the islands there. Yes. Forget about commercial properties. That's unbelievable. I am so jealous of the in in network companies wherein I watch them post, oh, look, we're moving into our 4,000 square foot warehouse office space. And that's what I'm like, oh, one day we'll get there. One day. <laughs> it's not going to be, you know, $2,000 a month. <laughs> well, see, yeah, see that I, I even get micro jealous about some of the licensed affiliates because, you know, they'll be in parts of the country where they can get a really nice place for $1,200, $1,500 a month. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's almost double for us here in Orlando. And it's probably triple that for you there in Hawaii. And, and they're... I, I'm I'm on the constant lookout for a commercial property that that fits what we need to have, um, and then you know with the business model and, and scaling up, going from a three truck and then starting the next branch. Mm-hmm. Where where would I want that branch to be and all of that stuff? But we're think we're forward thinking. Yeah, for sure. We're not there yet. We're, we're still taking the small steps, but we're working. So so how how are you are you revenuing? I know you you're you're rounding into completing your third year in business. You said you're a little more than two and a half years. Mm-hmm. How how are you doing? Rev- I mean, you don't have to give specific numbers if you're not comfortable with it, but how are you doing? Is this getting to a point where you're like, man, I feel like I'm, I'm getting some wind under my wings and this is really helping me achieve my life's goals and dreams? Because mm-hmm. that's what's important. Yeah. I think from, from that perspective, um, I haven't taken a paycheck yet. Um, I'll put that out there. But as far as revenues, we've we're in month eight now of 2024. We've already bypassed last year's um, numbers. Yep. Numbers. Um, we're looking. We're getting bigger, um, more interest, and we're getting higher tickets. And so, you know, all of the I I feel that all of the hard work with 
the networking, with your social media, with you know coordinating or collaborating with the news, uh, mm -hmm. the news agencies, um, different um, blogs, podcasts, and so we we've done a few, and everything is education. And I think the the more we put ourselves out there as far as education, and more people learn what the positive effects are of using our service, we'll just, we'll, we'll become better um, in both providing services and increasing our profits and helping the communities. And yeah, people are going to need the teams that we bring on board. Yeah, people, people don't realize how much work it takes to start a business. And even with softwash systems, you're getting a tremendous head start that you're not having to come up with business systems and marketing systems and sales systems and HR systems and, you, you get a lot of that stuff, but the momentum you have to create, you know, you, you, you mentioned that the revenues are not quite there yet to your goal that you feel comfortable pulling a paycheck out of the company, yes. but your revenues are growing every year and you're in a, you know, a very isolated area. You don't have the momentum of the rest of what's happening in the United States that all of a sudden people in Hawaii are like, Hey, there's this thing called roof cleaning. You're on an, People, people say, you know, it almost feels like I'm on an island. You are on an island. <laughs> you know, you're having to educate people. They just didn't know that this existed. You know, pressure, they know about pressure washing, but but you're really building something. And and people take for granted sometimes the amount of effort, the amount of time, the amount of energy it takes to build something up. And you're in a very unique situation, as I mentioned, because you're on an island and you're isolated. And except for maybe what people might see on TV or or on the internet, they they wouldn't necessarily know that this is important. So you're really having to work to build this thing. And um, I mean, when we talk about building a lifestyle business, this wasn't just sign me up and bam, it's turnkey. I mean, you know, I just talked to Jim Steinmark and he was like, yeah, I mean, it was almost turnkey for me. You know, the first year was kind of rough because the first year was COVID, but, you know, we're doing really well. You're really having to go in there and 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 it's not for the light of heart for sure it's where some people ask me why why i do what i do mm -hmm. so well what i'm trying to do is be first to market i'm right. i know i've watched a whole bunch of you know marketing videos and trainings and say don't get into something where there is no market right and so we're there are people that do what we do more as a side hustle than a, than a mainstream correct business. Yes, we're, we're, we are trying to be first to market. And so when people think of cleaning the exterior of their house, that soft wash away comes up. And we're trying to be that omnipresence type of company. But one that we help you think we'll help you, we'll help you so about that. We'll help you take care of your property. Oh, that just threw me off. So what well, it, um, We'll help you take you're, care you're of trying to be first to market and get everybody to think about, you know, soft wash Hawaii first. Yeah. But then also that we're a company that takes care of the community. Mm -hmm. so it's, it's kind of more than just doing having our services and taking care of our customers. I would say part of our mission is to help the communities that we're working in. And I've always wanted to do that. But they say you can't do that unless you have you take care of yourself. So first, I got to be able to take care of myself and my family once I'm there. Right. Most and important. I can take that next step and do what I've always wanted to do, is kind of work with the community. No. You've heard AC Lockyer talk the talk, but wouldn't you like to see him walk the walk? Now is your chance, and it's absolutely free. Spend the day exploring soft wash systems and disruptor manufacturing on Friday, September 27th. You'll see the business and marketing systems developed by AC at work. But no open house is complete without food. So be sure to stick around for lunch. To register for this free open house event, please call 855-763-8669. We look forward to seeing you on Friday, September 27th. For sure. So so what we're, you know, when, when you look at, um, what the future holds, you know, this, this, this podcast is building the lifestyle business. Where do you see this, this soft washing business that you've gotten into? Where do you see it in, in three years, five years, 10 years? And, and how is this going to play into you building your legacy and raising your daughters and, 
and 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 supporting your family and also to like you mentioned the community. Let's you know let's start moving from what what does the future hold now for Softwash Hawaii? I would say Softwash Hawaii is just the first step. It's mm-hmm. a big learning step. Um, what I think is pretty cool is that my daughters are already seeing what I'm doing. Right. right? They see the work ethic. They uh, they don't understand why daddy's always working and why daddy can't go go travel with them here or there. But my oldest is always, okay, let's go hand out flyers. Let's go do this. Can we go drive around in the truck? Can we go, can I help you go do this? Um, when I'm doing business stuff on the computer, daddy, what are you doing? And so mm-hmm. these are things that when I was growing up, I never had any type of right. exposure. So I'm trying to expose my daughters to things that you don't learn in school. It's stuff that you would learn at home from your parents that you can hand me down. Um, mm-hmm. With soft wash away, once, once we get on model and we get to the point where we're scaling, then it's, as you always mentioned, it's just repeating. Mm-hmm. So I feel that we can repeat to start the next branch, but we can also repeat and move into other potential businesses that would support soft washing businesses, mm-hmm. maybe landscaping. Maybe we can, you know, now looking into the the tax side of it, you know, breaking up the company. Okay, we're going to have a company that just leases. This is the company that will lease the equipment that will do soft wash away, soft wash sure. system. And, and kind of build from there. But in the bigger spectrum, to share with my family business, what it means to be business. And potentially build a network of friends, right? You are who you who you hang around with. It is, yes, yes. And yes. so our our network of friends are very, is very small, and that's the reason because we we want to keep it small because we want to be around certain types of people that both influence ourselves. We potentially influence them as well. But my my children are able to grasp and, and absorb information and experiences that put them. I guess like everybody wants their children to become better than they were. Mm-hmm. I don't want to give them everything on a, you know, the silver on a silver platter. Learn yeah. and, and appreciate the learning process and, and the, the gifts that come with it. And so that's my long-term goal, my goal and uh, the legacy I want to leave behind. I always I I, I joke about it, but I, you know, with my wife and my friend, said, I'm late in the game. I should have, I knew, I know I should have done this a long time ago, which is go on an entrepreneur, become an entrepreneur and start a business right. and go through the learning process. But because you're so comfortable with that, that drug they call salary, mm-hmm. right? they just enough. And so it's like, well, if I leave, then I lose all of this and then I got to do something else. So I got to, I got to figure it out. But they're paying me enough to where I, I didn't really want to leave because I was making, and then they push you out the door. But, um, I would not want my my daughters to go through that or my wife. And so here we are. We we kind of push through it every day. You take the roller coaster ride, you enjoy the highs. You don't like the lows, but you make the best of the lows to so turn them in the high and bottom. Kind of like surfing, you bottom turn, you go back up. Yep. <laughs> now you, you drop two very, very important golden nuggets or knowledge bombs in there, things that people really need to pay attention to. Daddy, what are you doing? Daddy, mm-hmm. let's go throw flyers together. Okay. Mm-hmm. You are weaving your business into your family. And so many people in Western culture would say you shouldn't mix business and family and blah, 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 and everything else. But it's created a touch point, an interaction point with your kids for you to teach them a work ethic, mm-hmm. for you to teach them stick to for you to teach them how to market, how to present themselves, how to carry themselves, how to speak. And so, it's it's almost like business homeschool, you know, and 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 that's so important because I remember when my son went to business school at Abilene Christian University, uh, you know, he would come back and, you know, come home for holidays and stuff like that and go, Dad, I feel like I could get up and teach the classes. I feel like my business professors, you know, they're they're all smart people, but they're really book smart. They don't they haven't really been in a business. And so he was able to mix the university curriculum with the homeschool curriculum he got in business. And, you know, and that's now he's, you know, working in the family business and and um, building disruptor manufacturing. And so that was number one, you being able to, you know, show your kids, um, you know, this, this is how you develop a work ethic. 
Okay. And then, and then number two, that, that legacy aspect of, of being able to build something that will take care of your family, that they, they don't have to go out and get a job. They don't have to get downsized one day like you did. Um, that, that if they decide to become entrepreneurs themselves or take over the family business, that they'll be more in control of their destiny and they'll have a taste for that. Even if they don't take over Softwash Hawaii one day, they've had a taste now of how you lived. And we, we, you said it, we always want our kids to have a better life than we did. Well, they're going to watch what you did with your business, owning your lifestyle business. And they're going to say, man, I want to be like my daddy. I want to own my own lifestyle business, or I want to marry a guy that we can run a lifestyle business together one day. And, um, and and then not be a, a a a slave. Now you can be a slave to your business too. And Howard Partridge talks about that all the time. You you want to get away from being a slave to your business, but also too, you don't want to be a slave to a boss. You know, one day. Um, you know, I mean, people can people can have a good job and have a good employer, and, but very very few people are blessed with that. Like the people who work for me, really, they they love working for me because, you know, I'm an easy guy to work for, and I support them, and I love them, and you know, we have a good culture and everything else, but not everybody gets to enjoy that. Um, not everybody gets to be an intrapreneur. You know, they're not an entrepreneur. They're an intrapreneur. They they may work for a company, but they get to work on it and build it. And, you know, they don't want to sign their name to the personal guarantees for all the trucks, but they want to be able to get a benefit of working hard in the business that is equal to what they're doing. Not everybody gets to enjoy that. You creating this business is showing your kids um, that when they grow up, they're going to have a taste for that and maybe not have to just go get a J-O-B one day. Yep. Yep. That's the goal. Yeah, that's the goal for sure. <laughs> and also too, and, and, and everybody really pay attention to this because Donovan, you know, is, is how old are you now, Donovan? I am 55. 55. I'm turning 55 in September. So we're the same age. And so um, even though we're in our 50s, we are our very social business, not socialized business, but a social driven business. And that we want our businesses to have impacts on the community. We want to provide jobs. We want to help people make their lives better. We want to respect the environment and all. And you've you've spoke of that. You want Softwash Hawaii to be part of the solution there in Hawaii, not part of the problem. Mm -hmm. Yes. So that's cool. Well, okay. So um, what would be your parting words if you, if you gave them to somebody that was looking at getting into soft washing with soft wash systems, what would you say to them? I would say, first of all, do your homework, do your research mm -hmm. and really do it. Don't just say you did it. Right. Uh, and what you'll find is that, but I'll, I'll share what my experience was and why my dis I made my decision to go with Softwash Systems. Is the equipment was there? It was proven. It constantly gets improved on. It's very um, straightforward and easy to learn and to teach. More importantly, that mm. was very important to me because I knew I didn't want to end up being the the owner operator. I wanted right. to be. Uh, what was what's that word we use where you step away and you watch the business do its do its duties? Oh, just but, owner investor. The five stages investor. of business development. Yes. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. And so that's what I was looking for. And then calling up and um, at that time talking to Jesse, the information that was given, there was no sales pitch. It was just I had questions, he had answers. Um he sh he shared a little bit more than what I had asked, but it just supported what the question it supported the question that I was looking for an answer for. Um, and after making the decision, going through the first training coming up, I know you're not, you weren't supposed to purchase the equipment before until you went to the training. I purchased it before I went to the training. It was that good. Yeah. Um, and I would say ever since that point, every training that I've been to, um, the online training, the, the Facebook, the support from the, the in-network companies, um, it's just amazing. I mean, there's a lot. There's a lot out there when you when you start looking at soft washing or pressure mm -hmm. washing, all of that stuff. And there's a lot of misinformation. Mm. And 
I look at, I don't just say misinformation just because I don't believe it. It's because it's things that I've actually physically done in the field where you watch a video, oh, you already have to do this and you already know what's going to happen if you <laughs> if you didn't know. And so, you know, having, I would say having a network that you can, you know, how confidently rely on is is why I, I decided to stay, go with and stay with SoftWatch Systems. It's I would never go with any other companies. And I'm not afraid, you know, as much as we're investing in creating a market in Hawaii, with what I have available to me today, I'm not afraid of other companies trying to come in and do what we do because we make it look that easy. Um, and I've had a couple of people try to hitch a ride. Right? Mm -hmm. They come in, they talk, they see me, they talk, sorry, I want to do this. And next thing you know, they're trying to buy equipment and do what we're doing. Six months later, they're asking me to buy their equipment. Right. But I don't need because it's not what I have, right? It, it, it won't support what I have. It actually makes me look worse. So hmm. yes, I would, I would, I would say do your homework first. Don't take my word for it or what I'm saying here. Do your research, make some phone calls, reach out to people, reach out to people in the network, reach out to people who are not in the network, ask the same questions and see what answers you get. Right. Pretty sure you'd end up compare with and contrast for sure. Yes. And that's huge. But that would, in, in those simple words, that's why I would I would continue to move forward with SoftWatch Systems. Well, thank you for that. We we appreciate you. We appreciate you trusting us to help you get into the business and support you along the way. And and um, we're, we're proud to have you on board for sure. All right. Thank you. Cool. All right. Awesome. Well, hey guys, listen. Like Donovan said, you know, if you're interested in getting into a business, becoming an entrepreneur, you don't know what it could possibly be. You can come on down to an open house for a Discover Soft Wash and, and visit with us down here in Orlando, Florida and kick the tires and see if joining the Soft Wash Revolution with Soft Wash Systems is something that you may want to do. Again, you know, this, this isn't meant to be an infomercial for Soft Wash Systems. We're profiling some of our licensed affiliates in our network so that you guys can see the effort and the decisions and the things that they're doing to build their lifestyle business. But they are building it with the vehicle of Softwash Systems. So if that's interesting to you, check us out, softwashsystems.com. And as always, thank you so much for visiting our podcast. If you liked this, go ahead and click like and share here and share the podcast. Go ahead and subscribe to it as well so that you can get more of our podcast. And as always, Go forth and prosper, and we'll see you at the next Building a Lifestyle Business.